Thanks for coming. Okay, and so now we're live. The appointed hour is six o'clock having been reached. I call this meeting of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals to order. My name is Steve Judge. As ZBA chair, I want to welcome everyone, including our new members, to this meeting. Pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately assess the proceedings in real time via technological means. Additionally, the meetings are recorded and they may be viewed via the town of Amherst's YouTube channel and ZBA webpage. In accordance with provisions of Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 40A, an Article 10 Special Permit Granting Authority of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw. This public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties at interest. We'll begin with the roll call of the members of the ZBA. Full members, myself, Steve Judge, I'm here. Ms. Parks? Here. Mr. Maxfeld? Here. Mr. Meadows? Not here. Mr. Cochrane? Here. Ms. Winter? Here. Also in attendance tonight is Maureen Pollock, a planner with the town, and Rob Mora, town's building commissioner. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 40A of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of, prom of promoting the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. One of the most important provisions of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw is section 10.38. Specific findings from this section must be made for all of our decisions. All hearings and meetings are to the public and are recorded by town staff. The procedure is as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board during the hearing, after which the board will, be, will ask questions for clarification or additional information. After the board has completed its questions, the board will seek public input. The public speaks with the permission of the chair. If a member of the public wishes to speak, they should so indicate by using the raised hand function on their screen. The chair with the assistance of the staff will call upon people wishing to speak. When you are recognized, provide your name and address to the board for the record. All questions and comments must be addressed to the board. The board will normally hold public hearings where information about the project and input from the public is gathered, followed by public meetings for each. The public meeting portion is when the board deliberates and is generally not an opportunity for public comment. If the board feels it has enough information and time, it will decide upon the applications tonight. Each petition heard by the board is distinct and evaluated on its own merits and the board is not ruled by precedent. Statutorily for a special permit, the board has 90 days from the close of the hearing to file a decision. For a variance, the board has 100 days from the date of filing to file its decision. No decision is final until the written decision is signed by the sitting board members and is filed in the town clerk's office. Once the decision is filed with the town clerk, there is a 20 day appeal period for an aggrieved party to contest the decision with the relevant judicial body in Superior Court. After the appeal period, the permit must be recorded at the Registry of Deeds to take effect. Tonight's agenda is a public meeting on administrative items and introduction of new members. At seven o'clock, we will end the administrative meeting and move to other items on the agenda. ZBA FY 2022-01, Town of Amherst Solar, LLC, to review the submitted written statement about providing public access, public online access to the power and energy reporting of the Amherst Solar Landfill Project to the Town of Amherst Staff Liaison for the Amherst Energy and Climate Action Committee, pursuant to condition 18 from the approved special permit, ZBA FY 2020-11, located at 740 Belchertown Road, map 18D, parcel 23, 
low density residential RLD zoning district. A public hearing on ZBA FY 2021-22, Christine and Peter Gray Mullen, requesting a special permit to allow an increase of the number of residential units converted dwelling from one to two under sections 3.324 and 10.38 of the zoning bylaw, located at 37 Fairview Way, map 8C, parcel seven, neighborhood residence RN zoning district, and ZBA FY 2021-23, Michael and Adriana Powell, request a, a special permit to allow a flag lot under section 6.3, 7.7 and 10.38 of the zoning bylaw, located property uh, located at Pomeroy Lane, map 20C, parcel 154, outlying residents RO and neighborhood residents RN zoning district. Following those two items, there'll be general public comment period, and there'll also be uh, other business that is not anticipated, if any, within the last 48 hours, and then adjournment. <clears throat> The first order of business tonight is a public meeting on administrative items. So first I wanna introduce everybody, I wanna welcome everybody to the meeting um, and thank you all for attending. I also wanna thank everybody for their willingness, especially our new members, their willingness to dedicate the time, effort, energy to this cause and to this committee. Um, it's a lot of work, uh, it can be a lot of work. And if you're gonna be a good board member, it will require a, a commitment of your time and your effort to do so and to be a good board member. And uh, just the fact that you signed up to do this it says great things about each of you. And I look forward to working with every one of you on this board. We have a excellent, we're supported very well by the town staff. Maureen and Rob do a great job. Um, Maureen is your first person to stop to when you have questions, the first person to reach out to. Uh, she's accessible, knowledgeable, and very uh, helpful. Rob is the building commissioner. Um, he is also extreme. <laughs> he knows more about this than any of us on the call. Um, uh, and we rely upon him uh, to a large extent to answer questions and to give us um, history and uh, as well as interpretations of the zoning bylaw that uh, may be arcane to most of us, but become everyday work to him. And so it's really important. So between those two people, Maureen, first and Rob second, we really get great support. And I want you to feel free to, to um, seek out their help and when you need it. Um, and that's especially important when we start talking about the open meeting laws uh, and the, the, the ability or the, the lack of ability for us to talk to each other as board members outside of a board uh, official meeting. So a lot of your questions, you'll not be able to ask your fellow board meeting members, you're gonna have to go to the staff to ask those questions. Otherwise it becomes a chance for deliberation outside the, uh, the meeting, which is not permitted under the open meeting laws. But we'll talk more about that as we get along. Um, and so what I'd like to do is first, um, Mr. Gilbert, we did not, um, we had a roll call and you weren't able to answer. So I wanna mark you as present. Thank you. Um, so what I'd like to do is just first, before we get started on the material, just allow each of us to introduce ourselves a little bit to each other. I mean, very, very briefly, um, just so we know a little bit about each other and where we live and, um, just, and just, a, uh, just an introduction. So I'll go first. I'm Steve Judge. I've been on the board for since 2017. I started out as an associate member. I became a, a full member in 2018. And was it 2019 or 2020, I became chairman of the, of the um, ZBA. I live downtown on Amity Street, uh, close to the, right close to the downtown area. Um, I've enjoyed this, this group quite a bit. Um, and I think we uh, provide a real service for the town. So um, that's a little bit about me. Um, Tammy, would you like to say a little bit about your history here? Sure. Um, I'm Tammy Parks, and I think I've been on the board three years, and I was an alternate. I don't remember. It's <laughs> Has it been longer than that? I don't know. I, th I think that's about right. Okay. Um, uh, I live in, uh, in Eastern Amherst, <laughs> if you could call it that. I live on the Pelham Line on Harkness Road. Um, 
And I just want to add that um, if you do have questions, talking to Maureen and Rob is really great. And they and you'll have a lot of questions. And both of them, I've called them a lot. <laughs> um, so they're a really good resource. They're both really clear. And it's it's um, I don't know. It's, it's really great that we have them as a resource. So you should definitely use them. I'm going to tag uh, Dylan in. Hey everyone, so I'm Maxfield. I live here on uh, North Pleasant Street, right across uh, from Kendrick Park. Uh, I moved to Amherst about six years ago, seven years ago now, something like that, for school. Uh, ended up loving the area, so I just stayed out here. I've been here ever since. Um, I joined the ZBA back in 2020, a little over a year ago, right at the start of the pandemic. So, uh, you know, the, this uh, Zoom format is really all I've known for it. So uh, don't worry, you're, you're in good company with uh, me here as well and, and doing uh, meetings in this fashion. But yeah, it's a, it's a good time here on the CBA. It's, uh, it's not always the most exciting work, but yeah, I, I think it's important work that we do here. And it's, uh, it's at least interesting. So you'll, you'll learn a lot. Mr. Gilbert. Hey everyone, pleasure to meet the digital acquaintance. I know I've uh, had the pleasure of actually seeing a couple of you in person at some of the recent site visits while I was bumping into Dylan wandering around town in the past. So uh, really happy to be here on the board. Um, I am a registered architect. I've been working as an architect in Massachusetts for about six years, um, bouncing in and out of the Western Mass region. Uh, I have spent some time in Amherst in years past and have found myself back out here recently uh, in pursuit of my MBA at UMass Amherst Eisenberg School of Management. Um, located, it uh, sounds like close to you, Steve, actually down the street on Lincoln Avenue. Um, so relatively close to downtown as well. Convenient walk up to Amherst Coffee. And, um, you know, just uh, pleased again to be here on the board supporting, supporting the town, of course, and you know, supporting all, all of you in uh, our efforts to make sure that, you know, we get um, relevant development coming through here. Mr. Cochrane, first of all, I want to make sure I have, I'm have i pronouncing your last name correctly. Is it Cochrane or Cochran? Cochran. Cochran, okay. Yeah, so uh, I'm Eric. I uh, just, you know, as you can probably tell, I'm a new member of the zoning board. And um, I, you know, uh, very, you know, doing this because I'm very interested in public policy. I actually got a master's degree in public policy from uh, Portland State University in Oregon. I grew up in Amherst on uh, Oakwood Circle, where I still live. And um I have a bit of a background in, you know, some political campaigns and a bit of policy work. Uh, so really interested in getting to know more about, you know, uh, working on, you know, uh, more about, you know, policy and zoning through this experience here. Great. Welcome. Ms. Winter. Yes, I'm also excited to meet you all and uh, to be part of the zoning board. I moved to Amherst from Stuttgart, Germany in 1979 when my husband became faculty here in uh, chemical engineering polymer science. I raised my forge here. Um, I used to teach literature at the college level and then here I taught at the Hartsbrook School. I became very uh, active in government just very recently because all the other commitments that have been crazy with having big families and moving back and forth between Germany and here, we've, we've been there a lot. We also have a, a, a place in Berlin. Um, all of a sudden there was a gap in, and I felt that this was the time that I should uh, dedicate to this town, which has given my family so much and which is so beautiful and which is definitely worth uh, putting an effort in and in, in helping preserve it and keep it vital. And because of COVID, I was able to log into these Zoom meetings of the boards, the planning boards, for example. Um, and that was very, very enlightening. Um, I also was a member of the local historic district and I became a member just as we were dealing with the very contentious and complicated issue of Amherst Media and that beautiful lot in front of the um, women's club and the old boys club. So I was very impressed with the caliber of deliberations that people, the time and effort that people put into 
their opinions, how open they were. Um, and I decided that this was something that I wanted to do too. So um, I'm, I'm pleased to be here and um, I'll work hard. I'm not an architect, I'm not a planner. I have been involved in lots of projects in Berlin with my relatives who are big builders and organizers of squares. And so I feel if there's anything that I can contribute where it's not the expertise that you have, it's just the perspective of having lived in many places and seen um, sort of the architecturally planning in, in other places. So maybe I can add a little fresh insight from that standpoint. So nice to meet you all. Thank you. Well, it's good to welcome all of you. I'm glad you're here. Um, Maureen and Rob, do you want to just just describe briefly your position and what you how you function for the group, and then we'll move on to the um, to the rest of the agenda for the administrative meeting. Maureen, sure. uh, my name is Maureen Pollock. I am one of the staff planners with the town of Amherst. I got my master's in planning at uh, UMass Amherst uh, with the Department of Landscape Architecture and Regional Planning. And I've been working with the town for a little over three years. And uh, my primary role is to serve the Zoning Board of Appeals um, to provide um, you know, administrative and technical assistance and among, among other boards and, and projects as needed. Um, Rob, I'll tag you next. Hi everyone, I'm Rob Morris, uh, Building Commissioner. I'm in my 10th year for the Town of Amherst and uh, work on the second floor of Town Hall in the Conservation Development Department that uh, includes uh, all the inspection services staff, all the planners, conservation staff, and facilities staff. Uh, so welcome everybody, look forward to working with you. Great. On the agenda that you received, we have um, several items. Um, which have been outlined and what I'd like to do is go through these um, each talk a little bit about them I think these are kind of hit the high points uh, I would encourage both Maureen and Rob if I miss speak or I, you feel a need to add something to what I'm talking about don't hesitate to raise your hand and interject and I'd like to hold questions for these as we go through them um, I think it's you, you, Ask the questions each time as we go through this. Don't wait to the end in this case. I mean, typically we like to wait till the end when we do presentations, but in this case, we're just, we're talking amongst ourselves. And I think if you have questions in terms of our administrative and, and procedural efforts, it's most important to ask them right now. So feel free to, to interrupt as you, as you see fit. Um, the first thing is, is meeting the quorum generally. I think it's really important for us as a board to remember that we are, the face of the town and probably the most important face of the town to people that appeal, appear before the board. Um, and, you know, they have to deal with parking, they have to deal with schools, they deal with all sorts of aspects that uh, of the town that affect their lives. But when they're coming to before the board of the Zoning Board of Appeals, they're talking about their property or they're talking about their neighborhoods or they're talking about their community. And it's really important that we do a good job of Number one, listening to them, both as property owners, abutters, and members of the community, and that we provide an a, a example of professionalism, decorum, and deliberation, uh, and adherence to the bylaw that is required of us. And it gives the impression, and I think it's an act, hopefully the accurate impression, that we are taking our job seriously, that we are taking it professionally, that we treat each other as board members civilly and politely and that we treat the public in the same way. And at times that might be a challenge um, for um, board members, especially in Zoom days where we're not, um, we're not seeing each other face to face in a room. We're seeing each other on a screen, which does tend to um, insulate people a bit from the normal inhibitions uh, of discussion, but it's really important. And I think the most important thing is to give the impression to the town and to the town residents that we know this is an important job and that we're taking it seriously and that we will give their opinions, their requests, their, their uh, applications um, due and full consideration. And so I think that's the first and most important thing. I think the second thing is to um, be 
uh, to work with each other and to follow for the procedures of the meetings so that it's structured, understandable, and we'll go through those procedures. But I think that's also very important that we have a deliberative process that we're used to, that we can kind of rely upon, and that as a group that we can operate under. So those I think are the, the core things I'd, I'd like to encourage each of you to, to remember as board members. The second point is that we are not a legislative body. Um, I worked in the legislative body for years, but that is not what we are. We are really a quasi judicial body. We interpret the bylaws and there is discretion that we have. That's why we are here is to exercise the discretion within the bylaw that, that the bylaw gives us. But we take the bylaws, we apply those bylaws and the discretion that's provided in the bylaws for us to make a decision um, is, what we, is how we function. That's our purpose. It's not our purpose to set new housing policy or zoning policy for the town. We may have strong feelings about this, about a certain policy. We may have strong feelings about what we would like to see happen, but we have to roll back on the zoning bylaw and have that be our guide uh, for how we interpret this. Each of us, and you will, have instances where it just doesn't feel right to decide what the, to adhere to the bylaw. Your gut will be will just feel differently, but you have to come back and make that decision based upon the bylaw and based upon the, the, the extent of, of discretion that we have to interpret that bylaw. So that's the other thing I think that's important. That was hard for me at first, because I really didn't realize that when I first joined the board, um, but I've come to realize that that is the most, that is a very important thing. Second, the third thing is meeting preparation. Um, it is really, this is really complicated stuff and it's not for most of, for me and I think for most of you you're not familiar with the 120 pages of the zoning bylaw <laughs> you're not familiar with all the terms in zoning um, it's a lot of new things for most of us and you're not going to be an expert right away it's going to take a long time to understand the zoning bylaw all the issues that come up you're going to rely upon Rob and Maureen for, for help on this you're going to rely upon the um the evidence that's provided at meetings and you're going to use your judgment at that point in time but that's all going to work best if you are able to prepare for the meeting and that means that you need to take the information that you get from Maureen hopefully a week ahead of time which is our goal to get that information to you a week ahead of time so that you can read through the, the application read through the very the, the project the draft application reports are really are really great they go through each of the, the zoning bylaw questions that we have to deal with. They explain, they give you the zoning bylaw, they give you a discussion about it, and, they, and in most cases, they give you a staff recommendation that, you, that we didn't either accept or, or reject or, or create our own, but it gives you a background for the, for the issues that you have to deal with in each of the applications. So that's the first thing, is to take the time to read those through. And sometimes that's a lot of work. Sometimes those are very long, complicated, um, things to do, but it requires some preparation for the meeting. The other thing is the, to attend the site visits. And the site visits are where you get to actually look at the property. You, you can physically view it. You walk around the property. In some cases you go into the property and you, you using the application that you've received, the application and, and the drawings or the, the plots, um, you look around and, you, and you're able to ask questions of the owner of the property. And then that gives you a, a, a real world feel for the applicant, uh, the application and how it affects the ground, the lot it's on, the neighborhood, et cetera. Um, those site visits are a time for just that, just for looking and becoming familiar with the project and the application. It is not a time for the applicant to make their case for their, app, for their request. It is not the time for them to advocate for themselves. That has to be done in the, in the meeting where the public can view that. So we try to limit it right just to questions and, and issues that we need to, to clarify what we're seeing. So we understand the, what's on the ground. It is not a time to debate or to, to, um, to deliberate the, the application. Each of the questions that we ask at the, at the site visit, we, and we try to ask at the board meeting so that all the information that we get at a site visit is made available to the public and is, is, um, is in, the public is informed of the questions we ask. The goal here is to, to the extent feasible to have the public have the same amount of information that we have 
And so they can, so as, when we make our decision, so that they can operate with the same information that we have. So that's about meeting preparation. I would say that makes sense. I'd say the other thing to do is if you have questions on when you're going through the project application report, you should run through those um, sections where they talk about the section 10.38 or section 9.22. If you have a question about it, write down on that project that, that draft project application report. So when we're going through it, you can have raise a question of, the, um, of either the staff or of your fellow members at the appropriate time. So that's a good good hint. This is really, I, I just really wanna um, advise you that I think these project, the draft project application reports are a great guide for you when you're going to, in preparation for this meeting. Another thing that I think is important is note taking during the meeting. I like to run these meetings so that everybody can have an opportunity to make their case fully without interruption for the most part. The applicant can speak, they can provide their full, their full um, presentation. And then we ask questions after that. And so I encourage you to write down questions in a notebook and a piece of paper, however you, you on your iPad, uh, for those of you younger who do those kinds of things, those of us of a certain age still use a pencil and a paper um, and write down your questions so you can refer to them when your time to ask questions comes up. Sometimes there'll be something you want it that just needs for clarification um, that may be the time you raise your hand, uh, but and we'll we'll call upon you. But try to keep that to a minimum, interrupting the applicant or interrupting um, a, a public commenter is probably not a good thing. Just let them make their case and then have time to ask questions afterwards. That generally works best. And note taking will remind you what to ask about. So I use I use just a, a notebook like this and I write down questions. I also write down possible conditions that I think are important. We'll talk about conditions a little later, but if you're hearing the, com the discussion, discussion of a specific application, you may think, well, I think it makes sense to make sure that the lighting is dark sky compliant. I'm not sure if that's one of the conditions that's there. I have, you write, make a note of that so that you can ask that at the appropriate time. Um, conflict of interest and open meeting laws are two things that are really important Dylan, were you going to ask a question? No. Okay. I, two other things that are very important, the conflict of interest and the, uh, the Massachusetts open meeting law. Conflict of interest, I think each of you have been required and I think have done the conflict of interest training, which is a, you know, like a 30 minute um, online tutorial. You, you have to do that every, I think every two years, you have to renew that. Um, and it's a good renewal. You should it, just refresh your memory. You should, you should do it. You could do it more often if you want. The goal here is that if you have a interest in the decision, in the application, whether it's your property is nearby, whether you're an abutter, whether you're an owner, it's a family member, the other things, you want to avoid a conflict, an apparent or a real conflict of interest. Real conflict of interest is obvious. I mean, you do, that we don't want to have a conflict of interest on the board. You don't want to be in that position and nobody does. You don't want to have a conflict of interest. But the apparent conflict of interest also is important for the, for the, qual, for the credibility of the board. So if it appears that you're, you know, you can say, I don't really care about that property that's 301 feet away from my, my property. But if you think that it's there, there's an apparent conflict of interest, talk to Maureen, talk to Rob, Ask about it. You can also you can also approach the, um, the um, Massachusetts State Ethics Department. Is it the Ethics Department? They have you can get that information from Maureen and Robin. I have done it in the past when I had a question about whether I had a conflict of interest or not, um, you, and they can give you an advisory opinion on whether you you do indeed have a conflict. Um, Maureen and Rob, do you want to add anything to the conflict of interest requirement? Well, I yeah, so um, especially the new members, you should have just taken the training and submitted a certificate. So hopefully, hopefully everything's nice, fresh in your mind. Um, but just to um, recap about conflict of interest. So, you know, a specific conflict of potential conflict of interest is having a financial interest of a board member or immediate family member, such as parents, spouse, siblings, or children. Um, and our financial interest um, between the board member and an employee organization in which a member is a trustee, officer, director, or a large shareholder, or a prospective employer. 
Um, so like if, if there's an applicant um, that perhaps you did business with in the last, you know, did business with um, in the, you know, in the last few years or maybe several years ago, um, you would want to, you know, check in with us uh, about that. Um, that's just one example. And then get the a legal opinion from, yeah, it's the Mass Ethics uh, Commission. They have a legal division um, and they can provide us information on that um, of whether there is a true conflict of interest. And um, and then um, and, uh, another um, sort of tip is that about this is that a part of these public hearing processes for a, such as a special permit or a variance requires um, a, a, a butter notice to be mailed to a butters that own properties within 300 feet of that um, where that proposed project is uh, going. And so that um, we ask that if you live within 300 feet of uh, an application that is before the ZBA that we ask that, you know, that you recuse yourself as that may be an appearance of a conflict, or maybe it is, it is a true conflict, but even just the appearance of a conflict, um, we ask that ZBA members um, submit a public disclosure. There is a form for that. And so you could just simply email me that and we would uh, submit that to the town manager and the town clerk. And then we would make mention of that at the public hearing. And then you would just sit out on that um, on that panel for that case uh, before the board. I just wanted to mention those two things or a couple of things. One last thing on disclosures. Um, I will at, at times uh, make a disclosure. We always ask for disclosures before we begin the deliberation on a, on a specific application. You can make a disclosure and that's a time to say it. Um, you know, I, the, the property manager for this application used to cut my lawn 10 years ago or five years ago. So I've done business with him, but I don't think that there's any, um, a, there's any case where, it, where that relationship affects my ability to act independently and judge independently on this. So if there's a commonly known thing, that um, relationship between you and somebody involved, and, it, and it's going to be a clear and not cause a real conflict, it's helpful just to disclose it to the public. And it doesn't mean that you, you have to just to remove yourself from the, the panel. Any questions about that? Cool. All right, um, the next is the open meeting law. Now this is complicated, um, but Essentially, the, the fundamentals are pretty straightforward. The fundamental is that all of our decisions and our deliberations with each other as board members have to be conducted in public. That means that, you know, you when I walk down the street and I happen to run into um, Mr. Maxfield at Amherst Coffee and uh, Maureen, at, and, and not Maureen, but and uh, Karen at Maxfield at Amherst Coffee. We can't sit. We can't start discussing what a great meeting we're going to have, or that that application that's on the that's going to be coming up in the next couple of days. We just don't talk about it. It's just not a. We can talk about the weather. We can be neighbors in every other respect, but we can't have those discussions outside this public meeting. More than you can discuss it all you want with the staff, that is just fine. But you can't call upon each other to discuss a specific application. And so we try to avoid those cases where we are all, where we as board members are all together in a, in a room. We have to make sure that if that's the case, whether it's the, the Sunday brunch on Lincoln Avenue or whatever it is that we're not in, engaged in that discussion. And I find that that's hard because if you are involved in this board, you're gonna be, that sometimes there's gonna be controversial issues and your neighbors and friends are gonna to wanna to know what you're thinking about this. And, they're going to say that they're building this X is taking place. And I really think it's awful. What do you think about it? And I think the best way to respond to that is, you know, I'm on that board and I may or may not, I, I can't talk to you about that. And if I do talk to you about that, I have to recuse myself from further deliberation. And I don't think you want that. So what you really want to do is be, be precise, be direct, and avoid those conf avoid that conversation with your friends and neighbors about a an application that's either currently before the board or that you know is going to be before the board. And I think that's it is important. And other people don't understand that the general public doesn't 
they don't deal with this because they're not part of the, these boards. Uh, you just have to explain it to them that you just are not able to engage in that conversation about those topics. Um, if you have real questions about the open meeting law, a lot of the a lot of the requirements about the open meeting law will be will be on my shoulders and the staff's shoulders, so that we have we with the, that everything is noticed, that things are followed by procedure. That's part of what we have to do. But if you have more questions about the open meeting law, there's two options. One, you can call town staff. Um, we could also have a um, uh, a session, an administrative meeting where it's described. We could have the town town lawyers or somebody come and talk to us about it if you want to. But I think for the most part, following the rule that you don't have a discussion or a deliberation amongst each other on a topic before the board will solve most of the problem with the open meeting law. Rob and Maureen, is there anything that you would want to add to that? Okay, good. Are there any questions then about meeting decorum? And again, I just want to stress that I think the most important thing is giving the appearance and indeed the action of being a, a professional, sincere, dedicated and hardworking board is what's important to people who are there with their life savings before our board and asking us for a special permit or making a decision that affects their lives. That's important. Okay. Um, I think that's also, I just wanna run through typically what we do in a meeting so that you're familiar with it. Um, for those of you on the board, Mr. Maxfield and, and, and Ms. Park, um, you've been through this, so you're familiar. But for those of you that have not been through these hearings, I think it's helpful to run through the process we used. I laid it out a little bit in the introduction and we'll do that every week. That's more for the public's benefit than it is for yours. Um, the, I want to make sure the public knows how we're gonna operate. So one of the things we do is we have an introduction, we have a call to roll, we start the meetings, uh, we list the agenda, we list what's going to be lit, what's going to be um, discussed tonight, and um, and who's going to be on each panel. And then we have we ask for disclosures. If there is any disclosure, you you provide a dis you give your disclosure. We review the site visit. That typically will be me to review the site visit. I will try, I've attempted to have written down, written down most of the questions that I think are need to be revealed to the, and disclosed in the public meeting. But if anything is forgotten, if I forget something, I'll ask you to add to it and to make sure that we have the, the, the description of the site visit is correct. We'll also review all the submissions. I'll list all the submissions, the submissions done by town staff, the submissions from the applicant, the submissions from the public, if there's any comment letters, et cetera, et cetera, so that everything is known to people who are watching this by Zoom who may not have all the papers in front of them. But again, the purpose of all this uh, seeming long and, and also kind of um, bureaucratic almost um, rec recitation that we have to go through is to provide the same information to the public that we're operating off of. So that's why it takes a while to go through all these things. After that is all done, the applicant presents its, his or her um, application, five, 10, 10 minutes, more if it's a really complicated, large uh, project, but provide a, 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 a presentation of what they wanna do. And they run through their requests for waivers, for um, exemptions from the, and the need, their need for a special permit. That, that is done by the, the applicant. And I think that's the place where we want to listen to them, let them have their full presentation and then ask questions. I'll ask the first and then I'll just go by seniority down the road who to ask questions. And so when you're called upon, if you have made notes, if you do have questions of the applicants, that's the place to ask them, the first place to ask them. After the questions from the board, we open up to public comments and the public has a chance to ask questions they ask questions of, they direct their comments to the board. They don't direct their comments to the applicant. They don't direct them to us individually. They direct it to the board or, and especially to the chair. And those comments are typically three to five, limited three to five minutes. We have a, if we have a large number of people, we'll limit it to, to uh, three minutes. Um, if, it's just, if there's not many people that wish to comment, uh, we'll be a little more flexible. But the goal is to allow as much public comment as possible. Uh, we're still having enough time to, to do our business in, in the night if we can. 
After public comment, the applicants get to respond to that public comment. And they respond again to the board, not to the public person that made the comment. They're, all the discussion is through the board itself. Um, we can, if we need to, the board can ask some more questions after that for clarification. Um, then we go to the next part. We close the hearing. And what I do is I keep the hearing, the public hearing open and we move to the public meeting. The public hearing is where the public talks, uh, can ask questions and where the applicants can make their presentation. A public meeting is where the board deliberates and considers the conditions and considers the um, findings we have to make from the zoning bylaw to approve or disapprove the application. So after the, after the application has been discussed, the public has spoken and we have spoken, I will move I will seek a motion to keep the public hearing open in case we need additional information and move to the public meeting portion where we deliberate. And we will talk about the, we talk about the project and then we start to go through the things that we have to do to make a decision. The first thing I like to do is go through conditions. There'll be condition, draft conditions in the application, in the project application report. We'll look at those. We may discover other conditions that we think are important during the course of the meeting. And we'll, we, can, we can talk about those at that time and vote on them if we need to um, on a condition. So we may discover that there is a need through the public comment, that there's a need for um, um, a buffer, a vegetative buffer between the two properties. And we may want to, that was not involved, it was not known before, we didn't see it in the site visit, it wasn't in the project application report. It seems like that's the majority opinion on the board that would be the time to bring that up. So the conditions are gone through. And I think it's important to know what the conditions are before we can make our decisions on the bylaw findings. So we said, here are these things that have to be done in order to, to if, if the application is approved, these conditions constrain the applicant or makes requirements of the applicant for certain things. And then there's bylaw findings that we have to make. The most important of these are 10, section 10.38. Section 10.38 really gives us is the outline for our authority for when we can uh, approve a special permit. Those are all, we, those are all listed in the, um, the application report. Those will, those, we'll run through those many times. A specific part of 10.38 may not apply to the property. It may not be on a floodplain. It may not, um, it may not need to have um, sufficient space for delivery vans and uh, other kinds of things. It may not be applicable, but many of them are. Mostly it deals with the effect it has on the neighborhood, the effect it has on, on the community. And that's what 10.38 requires us to do. So we'll go through each of those. In the past, I have read each of the 10.38 requirements in the, in the zoning bylaw. I attempt now to summarize what that zoning, what that uh, 10.38 says so that we deal with the, the core of the issue without having to spend a half hour reading through each of the um, for each time reading through the, the actual verbiage of 10.38, but to give the, um, the essence of it. There's also other, other sections that we're gonna have to make findings on. Sometimes it's section 9.22, which gives us some broad authority. Perhaps it's the parking section, section seven, perhaps it's other sections, but those will all be laid out in the, in the project application report. We will go through those, you will be aware of them. You can raise questions. But, but what we will do is assume that those, we, I, will make an, I will make a statement about whether they, we, th we think we meet those findings. If that's not an objection, we move to the next one. And if we have to debate whether we meet that finding or not, we'll do that before we move to the next condition that we have to make a finding on. Um, so once we make those, then we have, then we have a vote. Uh, we vote on the conditions and the findings. And then we have an opportunity to, to we have a final vote on whether to approve the applicant, the special uh, permit request or not. Before we do that, we'll have one more time to discuss it. There'll be a motion before you to, discuss, to approve the application. That needs four votes from the board. It's not a simple majority, it's a super majority to approve a special, a special permit application. And before that vote, there's an opportunity to discuss it. Um, and then we will move to a vote on the application. And if we have five members, that means we need four votes. 
If we only have four members, we can do business, but we need to have a unanimous vote of the board. So that's the, that's the process for the, the meeting. At the, when it's done with the application of the special permit applications, we'll, we have to have um, an open sec, uh, segment of time for public to comment on anything that we weren't dealing with that night. Um, and then we can move to, to adjournment. After we do all that, <laughs> there's still some more process to do. And that is the process of uh, the paperwork. So at, when we end the meeting, say the, the special permit application has been approved, we've got to go back and make sure that all the things that we agreed upon are contained in the decision. That's the job of Maureen. And she takes notes from the meetings, she reviews the meetings, she makes sure that the conditions are stated as, we've, as we deliberated them and approved them at the, at the meeting. The same thing with the findings. She comes up with a, a, a application report and a decision that we all have to sign. You will be given a, Maureen will let you know that it is done. Um, you can probably review it. You certainly can review it on your computer at home or you can go into town meeting, a town hall and, and get a, a, a hard copy. But you will review that if you, and then let her know if there's any changes or any questions that you have. Once those um, changes or suggestions are, are uh, looked at, there will be a final version that will be then available. At this point, we still have to sign those physically. We'll sign the decision. And once that decision is signed, then there's a process gone through for it to make it official and to put it into the, um, and to register it. But she will ask you to, to, to come to town hall to sign those papers. It takes just a minute, but to, it's important to do it as soon as you can because that delays the whole process. There's so many days from when that the decisions are signed for, this, for it to be registered and for it to go into effect. So the applicant has been waiting for that to happen. So keep your eye out for those, review the, review the special permit application, review the decision, and then uh, when the time comes, make an effort to get, go in town and sign it. I know we're looking at the possibility of electronic signatures. Um, someday that'll happen, but right now we're still using pen and paper to sign those decisions. Maureen, is there anything on the process that you would like to ask or of the members or that you wanna discuss? No, I, I think Pretty you much covered it. it. Yeah. So um, right. after, you know, when when I do type up the decision for, you know, if it's a special permit decision or a uh, variance decision or um, um, a, or a few other other a few other types of decisions that the board may take up, which is a rarity, but um, there's one called a 40B uh, comprehensive permit, um, which is uh, regarding affordable housing um, projects that all housing is, af is affordable and, and that's called a 40B and that's its whole other process. And then there's another type of one last other uh, type of application that the board occasionally takes up, which is um, someone is given a, um, let's say a building permit and they, or maybe they're denied a building permit um, and they don't like that decision. Um, they have the right to appeal that decision to the Zoning Board of Appeals. So in all those cases, the board would take up, you know, uh, review the application and uh, make uh, d a determination um, either to approve or deny the application before you. And then I type up the decision, you would review it. And as Steve said, if you have any, you know, you know, edits to provide, um, we will provide that. And then you come in and sign it. And once it's all it's signed by all the members, um, then I file it with the town clerk. Um, and that um, um, starts the 20 day appeal period. Um, so that decision gets uh, mailed to the applicant and the abutters that I had mentioned earlier that have properties within 300 feet of that subject property are notified again by regular mail that a decision has been reached and filed with the town clerk and that if they so choose and would like to appeal the decision, um, they um, have 20 days to um, do so um, by um, um, you know, have, hiring a lawyer or or um, making a uh, you know a, a appealing at superior court um, and notifying the town clerk, um, and so once that twenty day appeal period is 
ended, then the applicant um, files, um, uh, records rather, records their decision with the Hampshire County uh, Registry of Deeds. And that's when they can go ahead and do whatever steps that they need, such as uh, f uh, submit their building permit application so they can start the construction of their project, for instance. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. So I think we've pretty much run through the whole procedures and the kind of the, the, the constraints or the, the areas in which how we will operate and the, the parameters of the law that we, within which we have to operate and the bylaw that within which we have to operate. Um, I guess I'd just say two other things and I want to open it up because we've got 10 minutes before the for any questions because we've got 10 minutes before the meeting is going to move to the special application. First, um, we typically have the full members are the are the first call for sitting on the board. Um, but tonight is a good example where one of the full members is not able to attend. And so we have associate members who are serving on the, the, uh, the panels. So there may be, it may be, for associate members, it may be a long time before you're, between times when you're uh, actually sitting on a panel. I'd encourage you to watch a few of the meetings in the meantime, uh, get on Zoom and, and um, watch the meetings. I think that'd be very helpful, but know that you're not, you will be asked to be on panels just because people will have conflicts. People will be able, will, will have to miss meetings for a host of reasons. They either have to travel or whatever, for whatever reason. So associate members, you will be called upon. Um, it may be a while, it may, but then it, it could be, um, as we see tonight, it could be right away. So uh, just, by, just because you haven't heard from us in the last couple, in a couple of weeks or, or a couple of months, doesn't mean that we haven't been, um, you're, you're not still on call. And so get on the Zoom and watch a few of the, the, the meetings and that would be helpful, I think, to you and make you more comfortable uh, being part of the, of the ZBA. Um, other than that, I really wanna thank all of you for, for volunteering to do this and for spending the time that you're gonna, you, you will be spending uh, for the better, better, betterment of the town. And now just let me open it up a little bit to, for questions for anybody if they, uh, they have any or comments. Well, I think that's a good thing. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> I hope that's a good thing. Um, we've got one thing I would say is that one of the things that I think would be helpful, and we've talked about this, but we just we just haven't gotten it done, is there going to be things that um, Mr. Gilbert, you are probably very familiar with that those of us aren't. There'll be architectural plans, site plans, other things that we just we, we don't know what those squiggles mean on that piece of paper uh, that we're looking at. To see, and, and it's hard to make a decision on something when you don't understand where a drain field is or how, or is that, a, is that the side setback markings or what is it? You know, it's just hard to know those things. I think it'd be really helpful to have um, an administrative meeting on how you read site plans and what they are like. And I think that would be a helpful thing. So we're talking about doing that sometime this fall uh, having a meeting and I, if people would be interested in doing that, just raise your hand. Um, I think if that is something that people want to do, um, yep, good. So Maureen, well, that's something we should, we should plan and we can get some, somebody to kind of help walk through, walk us through that. Um, it's especially important when we have big projects, but it's even important on small little projects. So we know what we're making a decision about. All right, um, we've got six minutes before we start the meeting. And because um, we do wanna start the meeting right on time and not, not before the meeting starts, we have to wait till seven o'clock. This is open time for a discussion amongst us for anything we want. Technically, I don't know if we need to wait to seven um, because Steve and I, uh, we had to continue the public hearings from, um, can't September remember 9th, the date. Right? Yes, September from 9th. August, uh, September 9th. Yes, thank you, because we had yeah. a quorum issue. 
Um, but I believe we continued it to our six o'clock meeting. And so we would just pick up the, these um, application applications once we were done with our administrative uh, items. So we didn't indicate you know, a specific time to the public hearings or um, public meeting. So we could just... Um, and except I screwed that up, Maureen. I think you're right. But I, in the opening, I said we'd start at seven. Um, so if anybody from the public was waiting around, they would to comment on those two applications. Well, we could uh, take so up the pub public uh, if you if you are interested. Yeah. Um, the public meeting the for the town of Amherst Solar um, request. That's simple. Yep. Yeah. We can do that. All right. So um, unless there's any questions and I don't see any or any comments, we'll do that. We'll take up the first item. Okay, um, public meeting on ZBA FY 2022-01, Town of Amherst Solar, LCC, to review the limited written statement, this, excuse me, to review the submitted written statement about providing public online access to the power and energy reporting of the Amherst Solar Landfill Project to the Town of Amherst Staff Liaison the Amherst Energy and Climate Action Committee pursuant to condition 18 from the approved special permit ZBA FY 2020-11 located at 740 Belchertown Road, map 18D, parcel 23, low density RLD zoning district. When the ZBA approved the special permit for the solar farm on the landfill site, we required the applicant to assess the feasibility of providing public online access to power and energy reporting of that project and report it back to the board at a, um, at a public meeting. This letter that we've received, which was submitted on um, the, I don't have the date here, but it was submitted to Stephanie Siccarello. Um, this letter indicates they have found public access to be feasible and they will be providing that access to the Amherst Energy and Climate Action Committee. I don't think this requires any action by the board. Uh, it is just, they are complying with the condition that we imposed on the special permit and they seem to have uh, met, the con met that condition and they have informed us of that. So that's, um, there's no, it's just the function of completing and living with the conditions that were applied to that special permit. Um, now it's one minute to seven and we will begin the, the um, agenda for the rest of the public hearing. We'll now move to the public hearing portion of tonight's meeting. ZBA members sitting for the next two agenda items are myself, Ms. Parks, Mr. Maxfield, Mr. Gilbert, and Ms. Winter. First on the agenda is ZBA 2021-22. Christine and Peter Gray Mullen request a special permit to allow an increase of the number of residential units, converted dwellings from one to two under sections 3.324 and 10.38 of the zoning bylaw, located at 37 Fairview Way, map 8C, parcel seven, neighborhood residence, RM zoning districts. Are there any disclosures, members? Ms. Parks? Um, I would just like to mention that I worked in the same department as Peter Gray Mullen at the University of Massachusetts from 2011 to 2016. I don't believe this will prevent me from hearing this proposal in a fair, a fair and impartial way. Thank you. Are there any other disclosures? Um, we had a site visit on um, September 8th. At that site visit, we reviewed, we walked the property, we met with the applicants, we reviewed the um, the structure, the con proposed converted dwelling, it's, it's a relationship to the property setback line, reviewed the parking area, the um, trash 
and the um, screening of the trash receptacle. We looked for the lights and review, uh, examined or viewed the lights. Um, we walked around the back of the property as well. We, some of us went inside the property to see the, uh, the structure. It is, um, with a, it's loft and um, a kitchen. Um, and we viewed the neighborhood. I looked, looked at the end of the driveway, looked up and down the neighborhood. Um, I don't think there was much else that, in terms of questions, there was questions about parking. There was questions about um, the access to the loft and the, and the ladder um, to the loft. There was questions about the lights. Um, and I don't think there was much else to report from the site visit. For those of you who are on the site visit, do you have anything to add? Ms. Parks. I remember that we had some discussion about a concern about the neighbor's tree being um, kind of uh, uh, not looking great and really close to the property. Yep, that's correct. Okay. Um, the following submissions have been made to the board. Um, there are 25 of them. I'm not going to read all of them, but I will summarize it. There's a special permit application, a ZBA application, a supplemental information dated March 30th, a management plan, an additional information on the management plan, a lease template, a locust plan, a property map, a plan of land in Amherst prepared by Peter, prepared for Peter Gray Mullen, prepared by Randall E. Iser, dated July 30th, property survey excerpt, site plan, dated August 6th, topography map dated March 30th, 2020, a parking plan dated March 30th, 2021, studio elevation, or studio exterior photos, there are five of those, studio interior photos, there are four of those, uh, studio building elevations prepared by Peter Gray Mullen, professional design engineer dated March 30th, there are four of those, studio floor plan, studio interior section prepared by Peter Gray Mullen dated March 30, 2020, exterior heat pump specification sheet. Uh, there are four photographs of 37 Fairview Way, the existing house. Um, there are butters plans with photographs. There's a house interior photographs, floor plan for existing house, uh, for first floor, second floor, third floor, basement floor plan, a site lighting plan, exterior light fixture, and a landscape plan prepared by Peter Gray Mullen, professional designer, professional engineer, dated March 30th, 2020. Um, those are the submissions. Have there been any other, there were no public submissions that I know of. Maureen, has any come in since the site visit? No? No, uh, uh, there have no, been uh, zero public comments um, submitted. Okay. Um, that, concludes all the information that we have. Um, who's present for the applicant and who wishes to present? Uh, hello, my name is Christine Graham Mullen and this is my husband, Peter Graham Mullen and we are the owners of 37 Farview Way. Um, we're here tonight to ask uh, for you to consider our request to convert um, through the converted dwelling to change our, what was previously a garage that we've been treating as a studio for the last 14 years. Um, we believe that this was built approximately 90 years ago. Uh, there's a photo of it in 1932. And since we have moved here, it was a garage, but we lightly renovated it to be what we call the, the studio. It was like a, a, a family room um, and slash dance studio for our girls. Uh, we changed our windows, upgraded the heating, put a floor in. And then a few years ago, we decided that we wanted to uh, make it more of um, a proper dwelling and we, uh, built it, we pull, uh, pulled building permits and we built it to code, which would include the more environmentally sustainable, higher um, insulation and heating system and better windows, etc. And it's a pleasant studio space now. And we're coming to you um, to ask for it to be uh, converted to a permanent 
dwelling on our property. As you look at, I think there was a map we included in our extensive application that shows our abutters. Um, the actual um, abutters that touch our property are both as two um, student, uh, student living houses, um, actually three student living houses and actually UMass. We, that's one of our um, abutters, the actual campus. And then across the street, there are two single family homes um, with owners living in them. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you. So when we were at the property, um, one of the questions that we had and one of the questions that was in the um, application report, the draft application report regards parking. Um, in the application, in one place you talk about having two parking spaces in one place you talk about having one parking space for the new prop project. Um, I noticed that there are restrictions on street parking on Fairview, is that right? Can you park, is there parking allowed during the day on your street? It is Monday through Friday, eight to five. Uh, there's no parking, no but parking. weekends okay. and after five till the morning, there is parking. Okay. And right now the plan has four spaces for the owners of the main house and one space for the tenant. Is that correct? Um, that's what we put on the map. You can fit seven cars in our driveway if needed. But right now you're, what you're planning and what's in, in, uh, is in the, the lease, I think, is one parking spot for the tenant. We have seven spots. And instead of the two, we are requesting to just have one because it's a building that's only uh, the footprint's only 365 square feet so I don't know how I, I, we don't see more than one car being needed for that but if and of course live, if they yeah. wanted another spot that could be negotiated because we have plenty there's another six spots so I guess I didn't see that on the um, seven spots on the drawing but you have enough room for seven spots yes. on the property. So, and that would, without um, violating the, the impervious service, um, impervious, impervious service limit, surface limitations of your lot. Is that correct? Correct. We're right. all set. Okay. I think Maureen can right. on that. Okay. So the question I would have then is that you would, so you are open to allowing, uh, to negotiating if you need, if need be for additional parking with the, um, with the tenant, if need be. If a tenant was there, ideally, we, yeah. we, if we are, we're not, if we were to rent, which right. we're not planning to right now, it would be really a space for one. I suppose mm -hmm. a couple could possibly live there. And that would be yeah. the only scenario I could see where two cars would be needed, but we would still at that point would prefer them. Just we're essentially on campus. So yeah, we would prefer one car. Oh, I understand all that. I'm just thinking that these restrictions will flow to the next owner as well. And they may have a different feeling. And so we're just, I'm interested in knowing what you're thinking about and what would happen to the uh, property should it be sold at some point in the future. So right now we've limited, it would it'd be limited to one. Okay. So you would need, what you'd ask us is, are you asking for a waiver from the- You know, my husband the, just reminded me of yep. something. I was like, I think they're trying to say we should change the two. So um, with our background, you don't know us, but we would encourage mm -hmm. the one car, if not no cars. Mm -hmm. And as we move right. into autonomous vehicles in the future, we really feel that one will be more than enough for, um, this zoning area. I mean, the primary so, mode is certainly walking with any, any, I should say, expected tenant that it might be a UMass student, university student. Mm -hmm. Of course, we have the PVTA line on mm -hmm. North Pleasant, which is 50 yep. feet away from the nearest bus stop. So I hope people are going to be more sustainable and green in the future. Yeah. Um, and then one of the requirements of, the, of section seven is marking the parking. How do you, I did, we didn't ask that question. What's your anticipation of how you mark the parking areas? Are you just gonna have uh, what, rocks? You tell them you park right there. <laughs> <laughs> but I expect some kind of, you would 
have some kind of um, way to delineate the parking spaces. I don't, I'm not talking taping, I'm not talking uh, signs, but some way to delineate parking spaces to make it obvious to the tenant, right? I'm not sure what you're suggesting. Well, what? right now, section like, seven requires delineation of some way to identify parking spaces. And I suspect, I don't think there's a need for you to tape or to uh, paint your, your, your front lawn or your driveway with parking spaces, but some way just to indicate where the parking spaces are, whether it's through oh, yes, shrubbery, yes. So, okay. So yeah. I would, so if there's we a condition- We couldn't put says, shrubbery. How about in the lease, we would, I mean, we would draw a picture just, after. Yeah, we designate yeah, draw there. A, some, we'll draw some a way picture. Designate this. Yeah. So we don't have to waive the requirements I don't know of how section we would, seven. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We would That's just, what I'm um, and we can address we that. Draw a picture, the I guess. Yeah, delineate that. That's a good week. suggestion. Okay. That was the, oh, the, and the one, I have one more question, and then I'll open it up to everybody else. Um, is there a, since right now you're not planning on writing it out, in the future, that may be the case. There is not a, I did not see a complaint response plan in the um, management plan. Did you submit one and would the, because if property changed or if you decide to lease it to rent it out, we would, there would, should be a, a complaint response plan so that if the neighbors or somebody complains about the tenant, there's, a, there's some place to go. Um, you're the first ones, and it's typically somebody else as well. Is there, have you, did you submit a, a complaint response plan and I didn't, and I just missed it or did you not submit one? I don't remember being asked for that. No, as an owner occupied, well, as an owner occupied right. property, we didn't. I mean, we didn't read it that we would have some type of management plan or noise, as you call the complaint form. Is that required on for owner occupied? I'm thinking about what would happen in the future if it would be um, sold to a, a non-owner occupied. I know we'd need it, uh, but is that required for for an owner occupied? Structure of Robert Mooring. Yeah, uh, yeah. So typically, the ZBA has uh, required that all uh, rental properties that you know go through the Zoning Board of Appeals uh, would submit a management plan and um, a complaint response plan. And you know, upon change of ownership, Those naturally, naturally, those that information would change uh, with a new owner. You would would assume. So uh, there typically is a condition that says that you know, upon change of ownership, uh, the new owner needs to submit an updated management plan and complaint response plans. Um, I will say that I think I missed uh, mentioning to the Gray Mullins about submitting a complaint response plan. Um, it's uh, really quick and easy. And, and so um, I'm sure the Gray Mullins would be agreeable to submit it um, uh, after this meeting. So sorry about that to the Gray Mullins. I, th I think I, um, that slipped my mind. It's a, for your information, it's a pretty simple form. It just lists your, that if somebody has a complaint about noise or about whatever from the, your tenants, you go to the town and find out who to complain to. In this case, I'm sure it would be you. So, um, but the importance of this is that if the property is transferred in the future that, and it's not an owner occupant or somebody else, that there's a complaint response form for the, for the neighbors. So what I'm, I think what I would like, what I would propose is that we make that a condition that that one is one a complaint response form is uh, provided before um, this is finalized, and that's pretty simple. Form now, or when we start renting. So, if it's a not an owner occupied place, which I don't, um, don't you have to? Sign, like become part of the town rental? There is a town rental, there is indeed, there's a town rental registration process. That's and correct. is it, wouldn't that be part of it then that you it could, would fill it I, out then? But one of the requirements for, that we have typically required is a, is a complaint response form for rental property. And that's for the benefit of the neighborhood in case there is disturbances from the rental property. And so that it's on file. 
and it, it is not a uh, it is not a hardship to to fill out the form. It just provides a name of, of a contact if there's a problem. Now, in your case, I suspect that problem would be resolved because you're, they're your neighbors. They know who you are. This just puts that number on the form and filed with the town. And then if the property is transferred in the future, that has to be reviewed by the ZBA, the management plan and the response plan, not the, not the existence of the converted dwelling. That is not uh, subject to um, renewal, just the management plan, which you have submitted and the complaint response plan. So, so this only triggers if it's a non-occupied, no, no, non-owner occupied double rental. No. So that would mean both I'm, houses are rentals and then you, I don't, the owners would I'm gonna be, ask, yeah. I, let, let me ask Rob for that, but I, the fact is that this form is routinely required for all owner occupied and rental occupied. And normally the, the, the is on the requirements of, of the application. Rob, can you help? Sure. Uh, yeah. So I think it has consistently been uh, part of the requirements of the zoning board of appeals to, uh, to collect the complaint response plan, you know, in, in part to support and, and help make their 10.3 findings that they'll get to later for this application. Uh, but I, I will uh, just make note that it is not a requirement of a rental permit. So, you know, when, when a rental permit is completed, we do get emergency contact information is one of the, the questions asked through the application process, but it's not a complaint response plan as the Zoning Board of Appeals has designed it over the years to be, uh, to serve a purpose when supporting these special permit applications. Part of the ZBA process. Yes, it's part of the special permit application process. And where is that um, listed as a requirement? I think it's listed in the requirement of the um, application, but we will find that and get that to you. Um, yeah, and just to clarify, um, so uh, the form is to uh, provide three contacts um, if in case there was a complaint either by the tenants or by neighbors. And so for for the instance of, uh, you know, you're the majority of the time you, the owners that are going to live, uh, remain living there, you know, usually 90% of the times you, you'll get the complaint of, you know, A, B and C, whatever the issue is. Um, but th there will be times that maybe you guys are traveling or you're under the weather or whatever the scenario is, um, there would be two other additional contact contacts listed. Uh, so for the neighbor or the tenant that wants to reach out to an additional person that they know who, who to contact. So it is uh, applicable for both owner occupied um, rentals and non-owner occupied rentals. I don't see that in the application. It's, it's not. Well, I think that's just going to check. So we'll yeah, I, where else yeah, would it be listed? Uh, I believe it is listed in the ZBA rules and regulations. Rules and regulations. Yeah. Okay. So what what I would suggest is so that. So who would um, we put for? I'm unsure what. So can we list each uh, other separately? Like. Um, so I believe the ZBA has uh, traditionally uh, wanted, you know, uh, th three separate individuals, uh, perhaps not husband and wife. But so if you have a family member that lives locally, if you have friends that live locally, if if you know anyone locally that you would feel comfortable to say, if I have a complaint when I am on vacation overseas somewhere and, and my tenant has a complaint or my neighbor has a complaint I, that I can turn to you um, to be that, uh, that, 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 uh, that middle person um, to take that inquiry. So perhaps- you've put perhaps this, the, Yeah. Yes. You've put so this on other converted dwellings? We put it yes. on all, you know, all uh, residential, uh, rental, res uh, rental, uh, rental uh, residential permits. residential rental permits. yeah thank you yeah. sorry so do 
uh, so that um, uh, require uh, approval of the special permit through the Zoning Board of Appeals. So converted dwellings is, for instance, supplemental dwelling units is another, duplexes, converted dwellings, uh, apartment buildings. Um, so it, it we're not picking on you as, um, you know, as an applicant or picking on converted dwellings as a particular use. It, it's applied to all uh, special permits uh, that um, have a, a rental dwelling unit. To them. So, it's, I so guess anyway. it's just a surprise. So you can see how extensive the, you know, application submittal is. It would yes, just it's, be it's very extensive. You know everything. Yep. Um, but th one of the things that we do require is a complaint response form. So Maureen can give you that. It's simple to f fill out and, it's, and it would be, it would probably be, I would suspect it would be a condition of the approval of the application is to file that before, you know, within a certain amount of time. Um, that's if, all the if questions. It's a rental. I, if it's well, a rental. It, it, it's, if it's to approve the special permit application to have a rental property, if you have a rental property, um, if you have that application, you have a complaint response form. And that complaint response form will just list you, a, a neighbor and somebody else that they can contact in the case you're not, in case there is a problem out in the hot, in the rental unit. So that's the, that's, and it's done for every every application. I guess just my question is if we sold the house and the new owners are moving in and they weren't renting it, do they have to fill and, them out? Well, then we'll deal with that. We would deal with that then, but at that point, it's not a rental house. At that point, they don't need to have a management plan. They would not be, they wouldn't need the, uh, the rental property and they couldn't rent it until they've had a management plan. They had a special permit and they had a, um, of complaint response form amongst other things. But that is, that's a hypothetical that I, I don't wanna go into right now, Ms. Mullen. What I just wanna do is say, we have always required this, a, a complaint response form. There wasn't one in this package. It's a simple form that protects you and the neighbors and the tenants, if there are tenants. And we would advise you that we probably require that as a condition of the application. Well, thank you. That was clear. It's okay. just good for us to know yeah. what we're bringing on to as a lot, you know, as a something yep. on our property. If we were to sell the house, you know, what they're required. But my understanding is if someone buys the house and it's just their work studio or whatever, they don't have to do a management plan and uh, this I, contact plan. And that if you of. sell the house, the management plan and the, and the complaint response form are specifically looked at. And if they do not wish to have it, they can say, we don't want to have a management plan. We don't want to rent it. I don't believe, and I know that we won't need to um, approve those things for which there is no need. <laughs> if you know what I mean. If yeah, no, there's no need helpful. for it. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, okay. Are there other questions from members of the board? Ms. Parks. I, I just wanted to clarify what, um, about the parking space. Um, you were saying that it needs to be delineated in a manner that is uh, sufficient to visibly identify the space. And um, did what was the answer to that? I believe we're just we're going to draw a map of the driveway for the tenant. If and the tag, car. we can attach if, that to the lease, so they know where to and park. Does that? Robin Maureen, does that work? A, a map. So um, delineating the, the spaces is usually just, you know, the, the boundary between the, the gravel or pavement and some other surface. That's usually the delineation. If you're talking about marking spaces, uh, that applies for, I believe, five or more. We don't need, uh, yeah parking spaces and, and typically we wouldn't require it for this type of uh, an application. So um, okay. I think delineation yep. is dealt with by the material, the changes in material right. on the ground. Okay. Um, well, not the material on the ground, but if they give a map. So if they, if they give a map to the tenant and say, this is where you're parking, does there need to be anything in the actual parking space or can it just be that? 
a map. Maybe the applicant can describe how the surface of parking area is going to be constructed, but I, that's that's how it's delineated. So, um, and and if if there's a, a map or a sketch that's included as part of the lease or description of the premises for the tenant, that's perfectly fine as well. We had the um, driveway recently yep. finished, so it's uh, yep. new asphalt. Um, so we wouldn't want to paint it. Um, and there's a so there, there's an area that's clearly gravel versus paved asphalt surface. So that again, that application could make reference to a paved or a gravel space, depending I, on the needs of the town. I think that it seems to me that if it's delineated with a drawing in the lease. Okay. And that that would suffice for the um, requirement. Tammy, does that, uh, Ms. Parks, does that answer your question? Oh, you're, yeah. you're muted there. Sorry, yes, thank you. Okay, good. All right, are there any other questions from board members? Okay. Um, is there any public comments? We have two people from, we have Mr. Uh, Mr. Marshall with his hand up. Um, Mr. Marshall. Hi, hi Marshall, can you uh, state your name and your address? Yes, uh, this is Doug Marshall. I live at 64 Eames Avenue. And I'm calling in as a member of the public. Uh, I am on the planning board, but that's not my purpose for this evening. Um, I guess I had a general comment uh, and then a couple of specific comments. Uh, I think the conversation we've just had suggests that, uh, you know, not for tonight, but the town might want to think about traditional, uh, about treating owner occupied residences with either a converted dwelling or an or an a supplemental dwelling in a somewhat different way than the typical residential rental unit in the in the town um, i know as a property owner who has a large enough lot to put an adu or a converted or an adu on it i would i i'm i would be very careful about uh, bringing on and, and the burden of being part of the sort of bureaucracy of oversight uh, of the town. And, um, you know, I think the, the application was really extensive. And um, I think we should just be careful about how much we're burdening owners who may not be professional rental people um, with the, with a sort of over, with a heavy, heavy handed process. Um, and so that's my general comment and that might be a future consideration. I know the town is looking at trying to encourage more of these types of things. And if people are finding it to be kind of uh, a burden, maybe we, we need to look for ways to make it easier. Um, and then the second, the second more specific comment I had was uh, I see on the conditions that uh, you would require that all the grass was kept at four inches of height or less. Um, I know in terms of my own lawn, that's pretty unusual for me to be always less than four inches. So um, particularly in this age where we wanna be more sustainable and we don't wanna be running our, our two cycle combustion engines very often, um, I would, you know, and, and just as an, a homeowner, right now the town doesn't have a bylaw that says all lawns have to be four inches or less. So, you know, this is just one example of the kind of thing that I, you know, as a homeowner, I'm not sure I want to take that on. So um, that's my comment for tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Marshall. Are there other public comments?
If not, um, the Ms. Gray Mullen and Mr. McGray Mullen, you have the opportunity to respond to the public comment if you wish. Only to agree that it is an extremely intense process with um, an immense amount of documentation, drawings, and plans that are required. Um, my husband and I are civil engineers and my husband's a professional who does this, so that helped us and it was still very difficult. So I do agree with the public comment. It would be nice if the town could, you know, encouraging with the housing shortage and smaller homes, if they could um, look at maybe simplifying some of these areas for others to be able to do it too. Thank you. Um, any other questions from the board, comments from the board? What I would like to do now is to keep the public meeting, public hearing open and move to the public meeting portion of the uh, consideration of this application. That involves, really it's a chance for the board to discuss um, to, and to review the, um, the findings we have to make, uh, but this requires a, 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 a vote. So I would entertain a motion to move the public meeting to to a public meeting on this matter while keeping the public hearing open in case we need to gather additional information uh, in the consideration of, of the conditions and the uh, findings we have to make. Uh, is there a second, do I have such a motion? Is there a second? Mr. Maxfield moves, is there a second? Second. Ms. Park seconds. Is there discussion on the motion to move to public hearing, public, public meeting, excuse me, if not, this is a roll call vote. The chair votes aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Mr. Gilbert? Aye. Ms. Winter? Ms. Winter? Aye. 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 Um, five votes, the motion carries. Um, the public meeting is a time for the board to discuss our conditions and review possible conditions and, and make certain findings. I think it's most helpful to look at the conditions first. And that way, we, if we know if we can make the, we have a better sense if we can make the findings required under the zoning bylaw. So the first condition of, that the staff um, proposed is that this structure um, be in compliance with all the submitted uh, 25, 25 submitted plans as a very complete application and extensive application that they filed. Um, and that's a standard thing so that it's built and um, maintained to the submitted drawings. The rooms are to be used as, as they are labeled in the plans. Here's the approved management plan and complaint response plan shall be followed by the property owner and any changes to this plan should return to the Zoning Board of Appeals at a public meeting. That's not a public hearing, that's a public meeting where it's just approved, uh, re reviewed and, and potentially approved. I think on this one, Maureen, we just wanna say that there is, um, well, there should be a, um, a condition that just says that we have a complaint, that a complaint response plan is filed by the applicant. Um, all interior, exterior lighting shall be designed to be shielded or downcast um, and dark sky compliant as per the ZBA rules and regulations. Uh, right now it says a condition that no more than four unrelated individuals shall occupy each unit. So I, four seems to be too many for the, for the supplemental, the converted unit and four seems to be too few for your family home. So um, I guess what I would ask you is, is limitation on there, there, but there are four unrelated individuals. There's not four related individuals. So I think that if we had a limit of, what's the limit you'd want on the converted dwelling for a number of people living in that? I see by your lease, I think it's two. Is that correct? To yeah. live in the, in the converted yeah. unit, yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, and it, related, there's no limit on the number of relations that you can have in your family house. That's, that's not what we're talking about here, but that's for unrelated individuals. Just don't um, tell some so, of my relatives. 
Yeah, we have yeah. two kids, so if we have to get rid of one, it will be upsetting. But yeah, that, that wouldn't. We're not going to be that imposing uh, on on people who wish a special permit. So I think if that would state that no more than two people in the in the converted unit and four, four is typically that what every dwelling unit in town is is four unrelated individuals per dwelling unit. So that's not imposing anything new on you guys. Uh, six, any dwelling unit on the property being rented shall be registered and permitted in accordance with the resident uh, property bylaw. The street numbers should be clearly marked. Um, parking shall occur on improved services only, which you, and that has uh, been shown on the drawings. All parking areas shall be clearly delineated and shall be provided with a permanent dust-free surface and adequate drainage. We've discussed that. Um, I think we don't need number 10. Let's remove that. Individual parking spaces will be parked or otherwise delineated. Maximum number of overnight visitors per unit. Again, it's one thing for the it's one thing for the converted dwelling and something else for your family home. So um, currently, I think the maximum number of overnight visitors you list in your lease is you, you limit that in your lease itself, do you not? Yes, we do. And what do you limit it in your lease to? I don't even remember. I, I think, think it's, I, it. I think it was two, but can you help me with that? Uh, maybe two guests, I think. Two guests, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, I just want to make sure that. Yep. That we wrote. So my, we wrote. it seems to me that what we should be doing is limiting the, the, the number of guests in the. Yeah, in it's the number 20 mental house, but not in your family home. I hope right. Not. So yeah. it's, it's it so was in the lease number 21 tenant is 20. limited to two overnight guests for a maximum of four people in the apartment for no more than seven consecutive seven days. days so that instead of per unit maureen let's move that to the converted dwelling sure that makes sense yes all right um and then the maximum number of people in the premise at any time give me a number for the number of people that you would have for your, you know, if you're gonna have a graduation party for a, uh, a son-in-law or a grandchild or something else that so you'd have a, what's the number, the maximum number of people you, that would be on the property at any time? 25? 50. What is it? 50, okay. All right, so we change that condition to 50. And the, on the change of ownership, the new, it should be required to the Zoning Board of Appeals at a public meeting the management plan and the complaints response form. The property shall be free of litter and debris. Um, the last point was raised by a public commenter. Um, the board have any feelings about height of grass uh, and a condition for that? Is that something that we've, I know we've done this with, uh, with uh, non-owner occupants in the past and it's been a problem with some non-owner occupant rental homes. Um, any comments from the board? Mr. Maxfield. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't feel a condition like that is typically necessary on a um, owner-occupied property. I think again, if we're we're dealing with um, non-owner-occupied, I think it's different. But uh, I know we've dealt with similar ones like this before with owner-occupied. I've even liked putting in the stipulation on uh, overnight guests and things like that of also including uh, you will not exceed this number without express written permission from the owners. You know, giving given the fact that certain things might come up that they may want that, but uh, personally, at least at least with the grass, we'll just stick to that one. Uh, I, I don't think that's a necessary condition and owner occupied. Any other comments on that? All right. Um, I agree. I, I think for now, that's a condition that does not need to be there. So those are the conditions. Are there any, um, Objections to those conditions, or are there uh, any additional con conditions that members of the board wish to discuss and suggest? If not, given those conditions as part of the application, we have to make findings under several sections of the bylaw in order to approve this application. Um, the first one is section 12.09 uh, defines a converted dwelling. And a converted dwelling 
essentially is an existing residential or non-residential space that was, that it was constructed prior to 1964. Um, and they're, they're, they're going to convert it into a residential um, facility. It doesn't necessarily have to, it was not necessarily a residential facility. The town records show that this uh, structure was built before 1964 um, and that it, the house itself was built in, in 1929. It meets the age requirement for a converted dwelling. Also section 3.3 lists several standards for converted dwellings. Um, this building is a pre-existing non-conforming building, meaning that there are lots of um, requirements of the build that would not allow it to be built today as it currently stands. But we do not require that a building be <laughs> torn down in order to um, have a rental unit or a converted dwelling. We don't have to, it's a pre-existing and these are in effect grandfathered. Um, so there are several different um, dimensional requirements that this does not meet with. In order for us to approve the um, converted dwelling, we have to meet standard eight under the converted dwelling section. And that allows the board to consider granting the modification to the dimensional requirements of table three to a one time for one time for only one parcel to, in order to allow a conversion under section 3.321, which would add one additional unit only if it finds the modifications would be in accordance with the provisions of section 9.22. So the converted dwelling section requires us to look to section 9.22 of the zoning bylaws to see if this can be approved. Section 9.22 says that the special permit authority, that's us, may allow a non-conforming use of a building, that's what this is, structure or land to be changed to a specified use not substantially different in character or in its effect on the neighborhood or on the property in the, in its, in the vicinity. So we have to find that it is not substantially different in character or in effect on the neighborhood or property in the vicinity. It's residential, there's the, the existing house is residential, there's residential houses all around in the, in the neighborhood. Said authority may also authorize under a special permit, a non-conforming use of a building structure or land to be extended or a non-conforming building to be structurally altered, enlarged or reconstructed, providing that the authority, find, that's us, find such an alteration, enlargement or reconstruction shall not be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing non-conforming use or non-conforming building. So we have to find that this would not be uh, adverse to the neighborhood to move from the studio that exists to a uh, potential studio rental. Um, in my mind, it is not um, adverse to the neighborhood and would meet that requirement. Um, I, that's key requirement that we have to decide, we have to find, and I'd like to know if any members disagree with that finding. If not, moving on. Um, so under sec, we, make, we make the finding that we, we approve this under section 3.3241, which is because we found, made the finding under section 9.22. The rest of the standards under section 3.3241 um, are either not applicable or the, the applicant has met them. They provide a, a buys with a dem, there's dem, no demolition being done. The applicant submitted a management plan along with its proposal. The applicant uh, has provided a landscape plan and there's sufficient open space. Article seven is for parking and access regulations. Um, you have asked for an effect, a waiver from the parking regulation and you would, well, the waiver is in the right term. Um, but you want one parking space as opposed to two, and which would normally be required under this, under the zoning bylaws. It seems to me, with the size of the, um, with the size of the unit, we can provide a um, one parking space should meet the, the um, requirements of the and make the, the waiver or the exception um, under the parking plan. And Maureen, can you can we work that through in the? Uh, um, the findings. Sure. Yep. For, for that. Is there any objection from any board member on that? All right. So we've made the findings under 
seven point, section seven, section 9.22, and the section three converted dwellings. Now is the findings under section 10.38, which are the ones we normally have to spend most hope. Ms. Parks. I, I just have a quick question. Um, under uh, the sufficient open space per dwelling, um, mm -hmm. Where is that space on the map? Well, where's the, I think it's 2000 converted dwelling shall provide a minimum of 2000 square foot usable open space. I'm, I'm reading dwelling. standard 12. Mm -hmm. uh, standard 12. And the, what the zone, um, the zoning district that this property is located is in the neighborhood residence. So if you read standard 12, so it's 1,000 square feet of usable open space for dwellings. Is that right, Maureen? I just lost my place. Hold on one second. Yep. Um, so yeah, converted dwellings. Let's see here. Uh, converted dwellings in the neighborhood residence district shall provide a minimum of 1,000 square feet of usable open space per dwelling. Um, um, so uh, you know, when you do look at the aerial, um, of the property, it is very well vegetated uh, throughout the whole property in the back and in the front. Um, and so um, uh, I, I don't know if the gray mullins uh, want to speak to the size of that, but it, it does appear to meet that a minimum threshold of a thousand square feet. Well, you've got you've got 16,000 square foot lot. You've got coverage at what percentage right now currently Building coverage is less than 40, it's less than 40% because it wouldn't, I think, mm -hmm. where's the um, chart here? Yeah, so the lot coverage chart. requirement in the RN is 30%. That's the maximum amount of lot yep. coverage, uh, meaning that 70% um, that, uh, of the property would have to be uh, it, uh, pervious. Um, and so, uh, according to their surveyed plan uh, that was um, surveyed by Randy Iser, uh, a licensed surveyor, um, they're at 26.5%. So they are below that maximum amount of allowed in the RN zoning district. So there's there's gotta be, there's certainly more than 2000 square feet of, of green okay. space. I, I guess what I was reading was yep. for the use of the occupants. And so I didn't know whether there was supposed to be open I space for the dwelling unit or is it just the general, the yard is, for is it do you need to have open space specifically for a dwelling unit or no that's a question i haven't dealt with i'm going to talk to i'm going to ask rob about that yeah i think the provision just uh requires you to provide the open space per dwelling unit so there's two units there's a thousand square feet per dwelling uh two thousand square feet of open space it looks like there's you know 10 or 11,000 square feet of property that's available for that open space. And, and I think as noted in uh, Maureen's uh, application report is that it meets that criteria. So, you know, by okay. rough measure, there wasn't any question in that. I just didn't know if, if you needed to say, you know, this is your recreation space, but if you don't need to do that, fine. They do not. Okay. And I just wanted okay. to pull up uh, aerial view of uh, the, Gray Mullins property at 37 Fairview Way. So you can see it's 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 very uh, ve vegetated and um, on the site visit on, I believe September the 8th, we did you know observe that there is a gracious backyard um, to recreate and, and um, this front yard um, as well. Uh, I, but I'm assuming that that's not open to the to a renter. I guess I'm just thinking if I were renting, if I were renting that space and, and I want to go outside, is it, it's not necessary for uh, the owners to have a designated space. It's just, that's something that you work out. As long as your space available, it's not necessary to say what space is for that unit. It's just a question uh, for the town. I, yeah. It's Rob, I guess my, so, yeah, my I, I mean, I assumption would be to, no. I don't, I don't think you have to designate the space that's available for the occupants, but they are providing space of at least a thousand square feet that would be available to the occupants somewhere on the property. So 
you know, typically the board just, um, you know, would see that there's the space available, open space on the site. And, you know, if they don't see any restriction in the lease that prevents an occupant from using the yard, I think we're, we're probably satisfying the requirement at that point. Okay. All right, any other questions on the section three, section seven and section nine findings? All right, I'd like to move to section 10.38, which are the core findings we have to make uh, most frequently. 10.380 and 10.381 um, deals with suitability of location, meaning that it's in a neighborhood and that it's compatible with existing units. I think that we can clearly find that the application is compatible with the existing neighborhood. 10.382, 383, 385, and 387 generally deals with nuisance, um, either through light, water, flood, noise, odor, dust, vibrations, or visibly offensive structures. Um, it deals with inconvenience or hazards to abutters. It prohibits um, detrimental and offensive units on the site, uses on the site, excuse me, and provides convenient and safe vehicular pedestrian movement within the site. Uh, we have an existing detached dwelling here with two exterior wall mounted sconce light fixtures that are dark sky compliant. We have a slider for safety and security. Um, in addition, that their all exterior lighting will be required to be, be uh, downcast and um, comply with our rules. Uh, that does not, there's no nuisance created by this noise, flood, odor, dust, or vibration. I think it meets the requirements of 10.38, 238, 235, and 7. 10.384, adequate and appropriate facility to provide for proper operation of use. There's utilities to be found and they're, op they're adequate for their operation and the proposed use. 10.386 uh, deals with parking. Um, we will amend that. Uh, well, it says one parking space. So it's we've uh, dealt with that uh, here um, and clarified and you're not proposing any signage. So I think we've met the requirement of 10.386. 10.387 uh, combines We've already dealt with that um, safe vehicle traffic. 10.388 is not applicable. That deals with um, off street loading and unloading. 10.389 deals with disposal for sewage and refuse. Uh, the building already exists. There's sewage and water. There's waste and recycling and the management plan lists that. Uh, that's, and it's already being done on the property. Uh, and the board, did, we did look at the fencing and the screening of the uh, trash receptacles and found those at the, at the uh, site visit. 10.390 um, is, it's not, a, it deals with floods and it's not in a designated flood known. 10.3 zone, 10.391 deals with um, unique, uh, important and natural historic features. This is not applicable either. 10.392 um, has, deals with appropriate land, uh, landscaping and screening of adjacent residences. Um, those are the trash and recycling bill, bins are, are shielded from adjacent properties, um, 10.393, and there's, there's sufficient, also in 10.392, there's sufficient um, vegetation around the property to screen, um, satisfactorily screen from the neighbors. 10.393, um, minimizing intrusion of lighting. We've discussed that already, um, but we think that, uh, I think it, we've met the conditions that it's not intruding, light will not intrude on a neighboring property especially with the downcast lighting. 10.394, um, impact on steep slopes, not applicable. 10.395, does it not, does it, this is the key one, does it create disharmony with respect to terrain and use and scale and architecture of existing buildings in the vicinity? This structure already exists. So the, um, the special application report does not um, make, does not have to look at the existing building but we have to make a finding that it does not create disharmony with respect to the terrain and use. And indeed it's already there, so it does not create disharmony. 10.396, screening for storage areas that we discussed, that's already been looked at. 10.397, uh, <clears throat> proposal provides adequate recreational facilities, open spaces. Um, it meets the requirements under the act of about 2000 square feet. 
10.398 is in harmony with the general purpose and intent of the bylaw and the master plan. The proposed two unit residential units is in harmony with the master plan, section 4.8.1, 4 which encourages greater mix of housing types to be found throughout the community. The board has made a determination, unless there are objections from the board, um, that I'd like, to, I'd like to state that the board has made the determination to meet sections 3.3211, 10.38, 7.9 and 9.22. Are there any um, board members that disagree with those findings? If so, this is the time to raise your voice. If not, um, I think we are prepared to move to, if there's any further discussion on this, I think we're prepared to move to entertain a motion to approve the special permit application with conditions um, and as per our findings, do I have such a motion? Moved. Mr. Max, Mr. Maxfield moves. Do I have a second? Move. Mr. Gilbert seconds. Is there a discussion on the motion to approve the application with conditions? If not, um, the vote occurs and this is a roll call vote and we need four out of five votes to approve the application. The chair votes aye. Ms. Parks? Sorry, aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Mr. Gilbert? Aye. Ms. Winter? Aye. All right, congratulations. Um, you have your special permit. Uh, the conditions will be, you'll see the conditions are laid out in the, uh, the, the report and um, I encourage you to work with uh, town staff to get the complaint response form and uh, to understand that. And that'll be the only additional change that we see here. So thank you very much. Congratulations, good luck. Thanks to all of you. Thank you, thank you for all your work on, on the board. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is ZBA FY 2021-2021. Dash 23, Michael and Adriana Powell request a special permit to allow a flag lot under section 6.3, 7.7, and 10.38 of the zoning bylaw, located at a property identified as Pomeroy Lane, map 20C, parcel 154, outlying residence RO and neighborhood residence zoning districts. Are there any disclosures? If not, the site visit was conducted on the 8th. Um, we walked the length of the proposed driveway of the flag lot from the front to the back uh, through a um, mosquito infested <laughs> dri proposed driveway, if I remember. Um, and we observed the property line, we observed the trees, uh, some of which needed to be come down. Uh, we uh, we uh, walked with the property owner back to where the, the structure would be sited. Um, and it's planned to be built. We, as I said, we identified several trees that need to be removed for the driveway. Uh, we've confirmed the driveway grade to be less than, to be approximately 2.5%, which is less than the required, I think it's 4% that needs to be, it needs to be less than um, for our driveway, 4% grade. Um, and and we, have, uh, we went over the, the briefly the plans for the, the, the sketches for the, residence that is going to be sited there. Um, and we and that was the, the site visit. Uh, does anybody else want to add anything other than it's a good time, it's a good thing to take off the next time we go to that, <laughs> walk that space, <laughs> or at least have more breeze on that day. Yeah. Um, anybody else? I think that's pretty much it. Um, let me just go through the um, submissions. We have a, a special application permit submitted by the applicant, a project summary, a site plan prepared by Brian Walsh, dated June 6th, Powell Barn drawings prepared by Michael Powell Builder, Builder and licensed construction supervisor, dated July 25th, and that has a first, second floor plan and north-south view, as well as a cross-section view and elevations. And the Powell home drawings prepared by Michael Powell Builder and licensed construction supervisor, dated July 25th, 2020, which has 
east and west side views, south rear side views, first floor and second floor plans. There's a staff submissions of a project application report, comment from the town engineer dated September 7th, Jason Steeles. And there are none listed, no public comments listed. Maureen, has there been any public comments submitted uh, on this application? No, there hasn't. Okay. Um, that is all the, um, the submissions. Um, Mr. Paul, do you wish to address, are you representing yourself? Yes, yes, thank you. Good evening. All right, Paul. just identify yourself for the record. Uh, and your I address. am Michael Powell. This is my wife, Adriana Barbara, uh, Adriana Powell. <laughs> and uh, we're, we're interested in building a, a home for our growing family in the back uh, flag lot here. And um, <clears throat> we currently reside at 149 Pomeroy Lane. And we are requesting approval to proceed with our plans to build a single family home on the uh, rear flag lot. Um, it's <clears throat> the five bedroom home is being built, uh, as I said, to suit our needs, we're, we're outgrown our current uh, residence in the front there, and uh, we'd like to build a larger home in the back. And uh, <clears throat> uh, more details is uh, it's going to be set back about 400 feet. It's protected by surrounding uh, privacy uh, vegetative buffer. Uh, the clearing is indicated there on the site plan that so we will have to remove some trees to provide the drive that will, will get us back there to uh, also accommodate the fire requirements. The fire department <clears throat> requires the wide driveway. So we, we indicated that there that we'll, we'll conform to that. Um, our, the, the home design is as drawn in the accompanying plans. Uh, it'll be attractive uh, sort of a New England farmhouse style <clears throat> with a front porch and side porch, traditional colonial dimensions Clabbered siding, uh, we're thinking painting it white or cream or beige light color tones. Uh, we will conform to the lighting requirement down facing. Uh, we have uh, a two car garage uh, for parking as well as the extensive uh, 20 foot wide driveway will accommodate additional parking as well. Uh, we indicated that our, our our waste barrels will be picked up by USA Recycling and stored in the garage. Um, all the landscaping and snow removal will be managed by the homeowner. <clears throat> um, we have a, a, <clears throat> a stormwater management grading plan. Uh, we'll have uh, along the driveway line, a grass line swale will absorb the stormwater back into the water table and disperse the excess runoff uh, towards the storm drain away from the neighboring properties. The grading uh, has been designed to disperse the water into the swale. Um, and we, we will have to remove some trees in the process of the driveway, but we like to be selective about that and only remove what we really have to. So uh, that's, on our, that's on our list. Um, and I think that's about it. Thank you. Um, just describe for me again um, how you're dealing with the water runoff from the new, the new site uh, building location. Just go over that again. I was I wasn't looking at the um, <clears throat> there, box when you were discussing it. Yes, and along the left, to... as along the left side indicated by the sort of like an orange hash marked line, there'll be yep. a grass line swale to uh, handle any excessive uh, uh, waste. Uh, uh, excessive uh, water runoff, storm drainage, storm water. Mm -hmm. Is that swale, how deep or high is that swale? It's, um, I would say it's not, uh, I would say a foot deep maybe, uh, it's yeah. nothing significant, but it's just a, a shallow uh, recessed uh, area that will allow the water to uh, re be reabsorbed into the soil. Yeah, and of course it will, Will that be going downhill too? It it's does. higher. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it, so, as the as the grade of the driveway, it, it follows yeah. the, the similar uh, down two two point two percent grade uh, towards the street, and uh, there is there is a storm drain located uh, in the general vicinity of the bottom of the driveway. All right. Um. 
Um, does anybody have questions for, do anybody on the board have questions for the Powells? All right, um, is there any public comment? Anybody from the public who wishes to comment on this application? Not tonight. No one, no? no one from the public. No one there. Is, no one's there. All right. Um, anything else you want to say uh, as an applicant before we uh, go to a public meeting? All right. Uh, unless a board member has questions or a comment, I would entertain a motion that we um, move to the public hearing excuse me, move to the public meeting uh, where we can discuss this while keeping the public hearing open in case we need to ask additional questions or get additional information from the applicants. Do I have a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Um, any discussion? All votes have to be by roll call. Um, I vote aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Mr. Gilbert? Aye. Ms. Winter? Aye. Great. So we're now in the public, the public meeting section um, where we discuss the um, conditions and findings we have to make as well as the project. Is there any general discussion on the project or the application from any members of the board? Not, it seems to me that this is a, a, an application that we should uh, try to approve. And if we can make the findings, which it seems to me we can make. Um, the first finding deals with, first I'd like to go look at conditions that have been proposed by the staff. Um, possible conditions of approval. The first is the standard that the project shall be built in accordance to the plans that are submitted to the town. I think that is, uh, it's always the case that we um, need to have that condition. Number two, all exterior lighting shall be designed so as to be shielded or downcast and to avoid light trespass onto adjacent properties. Dark high sky compliance recommend in compliance with our dark sky compliance recommendations of the ZBA rules and regulations. Um, the, the street address needs to be posted with for the dwelling units with reflected numbering and sufficient for inspection services. So that's something that you would need to do uh, that don't, you don't currently have. Unimpeded access shall be provided across either access strip or an easement at least 20 feet wide. That is, um, and what, and Maureen, what was Mr. Skeels, or no, was it the fire department that said it was sufficient or did they, did they have a comment on the driveway? Uh, the, the fire department um, uh, does not have any comments uh, to provide. Okay. And, so um, and the, feet, yeah, they um, the applicant does provide 20, uh, 20 foot wide access as indicated okay. in their in their site plan. And the the um, fire department did not talk about a need for a turnaround or something into the flag lot in the back. Um, the applicant provides a, a turnaround in, at at the um, end of the driveway. Okay, so they they've seen it and they've approved it. Okay. Correct. Yes. Um, before the issuance of any building permits, the applicant shall obtain sewer, water, driveway, and trench permits from the Amherst Public Department of Public Works. That's the other condition that we have uh, proposed. Those all seem to make sense to me. Are there any other conditions that people um, wish to consider or propose? Okay. If not, um, let's move to the findings we need to make. The findings are, um, first of all, the flag lot um, shall be at least double the minimum lot area normally required for that district, except in cluster subdivision. So majority of the properties in the RO zoning district, minimum lot 30,000 square feet. The zoning area is proposed configuration is or without an access street is more than double the minimum lot area normally required for the R zone zoning district to which the house is located. So in the um, minimum lot area, it meets the compliance, it's 81,000 
square feet for the, the lots. Section 6.33, each lot shall have an access strip, a minimum street frontage of 40 feet, a minimum width of 40 feet at any point between the street and the principal building and a maximum length of 400 feet, after which distance the access strip shall end and the building area of the lot shall begin. Um, for any flag lot, we have to find that it will not have substantial detrimental impact on the declared intent and purposes of any overlay district, not create an undue safety hazard, not create a substantial adverse environmental impact, not remove or destroy or obstruct prominent natural features, not remove, destroy, or irre irrevocably alter significant historical and other res cultural resources. The property provides the access strip with a street frontage. The access strip is not in excess of 400 feet. Um, and I think it meets the requirements of 3.0, 3.1, 3.2, 3.3, 34 by not destroying, removing, or providing adverse env environmental impact or undue safety hazards. The widths of that portion of the lot where the principal building is to be constructed shall be known as the building area, shall equal be an area equal or exceeding the distance normally required for street frontage. The building area is 200 feet wide and that meets the street frontage requirements for the RO zoning district. The portion of the flag lot within which the principal building is to be located shall be considered a building area. The building of the flag lot should be capable of containing a circle whose diameter is equal to or greater than the minimum standard street frontage required. As shown on the submitted plan, my earphones just stopped there. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Um, the flag lot has frontage uh, circle 200 feet and meets the requirements for the RO zoning district. There should be no more than three flag lots adjacent to each other. There's just this one flag lot and the lot shall meet the requirements of section 7.7, .7, which we're getting to. Flag lots unimpeded access shall provide either a access strip and easement of at least 20 feet wide, that's provided. The driveway of the access strip easement shall have adequate drainage and not exceed a 5% grade. We've met that, or the, the application has met that. The town engineer has reviewed this application and has no property, a pro problems with the property, and the applicant states the property summary will maintain the existing drainage easement currently in place for 161 Pomeroy Lane. 7.703 um, is not applicable. 7.704 um, driveway shall meet the requirements of 7.71. Um, the common driveway is not proposed or it's not proposed, that's for, that therefore 7.710 is not applicable. 7.711 uh, will, be, will, be will not be shared with any other property. Again, um, that's not applicable. 7.712 common driveway, so not less than 16 feet in width. This is a 20 foot wide gravel driveway and a turnaround proposed at the end of the driveway. 7.712 is met, 7.713 driveway lengths, um, 400 feet, uh, a common driveway is not proposed. Again, it's not applicable, 7.713. Um, it meets the length of the individual driveway is 492 feet. It meets the, the proposal, which is limited to 1200 feet, um, 7.7132. Longer driveway may be allowed on the planning board in accordance with seven. We don't the, we don't need to have a longer driveway. Seven point seven one three three uh, individual driveway originating at street should not be limited. This is not applicable. Seven point seven one four um, does not exceed the grade. The grade is two point two. Um, seven point seven one seven point seven one six. Um, Center line shall not be less than 60 degrees, it's straight. 717 meets the curb radii, 7.718. The proposal meets the requirements dealing with a common driveway for fire or other emergency vehicles, 7.719. Street addresses shall be posted, that's in the, that's in the um, um, conditions. 7.720, an agreement providing access over common driveway and only from the other. It's not proposed, not applicable, 7.721. Um, engineer plans, proposed grading is, is there. 7.722, the driveway does not exceed the maximum length allowed. Um, it meets all the dimensional requirements. Uh, so now, and it meets all the 
driveway requirements. Um, are there any questions regarding the findings we make under 10 point, uh, under, excuse me, under seven and under, um, under six? If not, I'd like to go to 10.38. 10.38 specific findings deal with uh, the first is it's suitably located. It's allowed by special permit in its existing fa single family home and suitably located in the neighborhood. 10.382, 383, 385, and 387 all deals with generally deal with nuisance of noise, pollution, light, uh, uh, noise, order, dust, and safety of pedestrian, pedestrian traffic the trees surrounding the lot uh, and the uh, downcast lighting um, prevent this from being a nuisance to its neighbors. 10.384, adequate and appropriate facilities were provided for proper operation, proper operation and use. Um, you, you will need to obtain a uh, sewer driveway and trench permits all from public works before you begin doing any work. So you'll meet the requirements of 10.384 before you'll be able to start any work. 10.386, um, your conformance, you don't, have a, you don't have a parking space, but there's more than enough room for parking spaces on the property. Um, 10.387, the proposal provides convenient and safe vehicular traffic. Uh, this does not generate excessive traffic in the neighborhood by the addition of the one single family home. 10.388, ensures adequate space for off-street loading is not applicable. 10.389, the proposal provides adequate methods of disposal for sewage. Um, you're proposing to connect to town sewage, if I'm correct. That's correct. Right. So you meet the uh, you meet 10.389, 10.390 proposal ensures protection from floods. It's not in the flood zone. Uh, 10.391 is not applicable. That deals with uh, natural historic features. 392 is deals with you know adequate um, vegetation. I can certify to everybody that there's lots of vegetation that exists in that on that land right now 10.393 and that it's adequate to screen it from all the the neighbors 10.393 the proposal provides protection of adjacent property by again minimizing light noise and um, you, you'll have to comply with the uh, dark sky compliant recommendations of the zva regulations so you will meet that 10.394 proposed avoids uh, Impact on steep slopes. Um, we have no issues with the grade. The town engineer has reviewed and has no issues with grading and drainage methods. 10.395 does not, the proposal does not create disharmony with respect to terrain use scale and architecture structure of the building. Uh, the, first of all, it's separated from other homes and is not generally viewed by the neighbors. Um, secondly, uh, we, the drawings seem to be to comport with. Um, housing styles and matters that are uh, ubiquitous across uh, our community. So I don't think it, um, there's any question that you meet the, the requirements of text, section 10.395. 10.396, the proposal provides for screenage from storage areas. This is not in dumpsters, et cetera, um, loading docks. This is not applicable. 10.397 has enough recreation facilities and open space. You have a large lot. Um, that, would be adequate. 10.398, the proposal is in harmony with the general purpose and intent of this bylaw and the goal of the master plan. Um, the flag lot is compatible with the master plan as the property is located within outlying areas of the town. The board needs to determine whether the proposal meets section 6.3, 7.7, and 10.38 under, uh, under the zoning bylaws. I think, unless there's objection from any member of the board, you have met the requirements and was necessary under section 6.3, 7.7, and 10.38 of the zoning bylaw. Are there any other conditions, questions, or concerns raised about the findings or the conditions? I think it's appropriate to have a motion to approve the application with conditions. At this point, is there a do I have a motion? So moved. Ms. Parks was first this time. <laughs> Mr. Maxfield, was that you for second? Okay. All right. Um, so we have, it's been moved and seconded. Um, discussion on the motion to approve the special permit application 
with conditions as stated um, previously. There's no discussions. The vote occurs on the motion to approve the special permit application. This is a roll call vote. The chair votes aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Mr. Gilbert? Aye. Ms. Winter? Aye. Motion carries. Congratulations. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Appreciate it. Time. So much. Thanks, Maureen. Thank you all. Thank you all. All right. Um, that completes our uh, scheduled business for the day. Um, we do have two other things on the agenda which um, are available. One is the um, this is the time when any member of the public can raise an issue to discuss before the board on a matter that is not before the board tonight. I see no um, hands up. I see no members of the public except for us that have stayed with us for these two and a half hours. So um, I don't think there's any additional comments. This is also the time where anybody can raise an issue that's not on the, on the agenda. And that's, and Ms. Parks, that's where you can raise an issue. I was just saying, before we're done, I just noticed in, in the um, last application that in flag lots, there's a missing number. And so I went back to the zoning bylaw and there's a missing number there. So under um, 6.3 flag lots, under 6.33, there's points one, zero, one, two, three, skipping four and then to five. Not that it matters, just a little typo there. I just wondered if we were missing something vital, but no, <laughs> just a note. A good catch, um, but I don't think it, a, a good catch and something we'll fix for the future. Any other comments? Well, I appreciate this is the, for our new members. This is the first one under your belt. Um, this was a, we always try to get this done by nine o'clock. Um, and if we can't get it done by nine or shortly thereafter, we will continue the meeting to the next day unless there's a desire of the board to stay and continue to endure through this meeting. But the goal is always to have a three hour, to have a limit of three hours. And if we can do that, we try our very best. And so tonight we were able to get it done uh, before that. So I think I thank all of you for letting us get this done as expeditiously as possible. Um, that's it from, from me. Anything else from anybody else? If not, I'd entertain a motion to, to adjourn. Is there a motion? Yes, motion to adjourn. <laughs> Ms. Parks moves. <laughs> Mr. Maxfield, he came in second again. Mr. Maxfield seconds. The motion to adjourn is not debatable. It is a roll call vote. Um, chair votes aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Mr. Gilbert? Aye. Ms. Winter? Aye. We are adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. <laughs>